Good morning, I'm Brian O'Neill, and we're continuing our series of shows from the Kevin Doran days in September 1990. This is a great show. Kevin Doran interviewed Nina Markovna, who went from Russia to Germany and then to the U.S. That was during World War II. Nina Markovna spoke with Kevin about the communists and the Nazis and what it was like under those regimes. That'll be segment one. Then coming up in segment two, a somewhat similar story from Soviet immigrant uh, Leon Weinstein, who left the Soviet Union in 1972. That'll be a newsmaker in segment two from November of 2012. So starting off with Kevin Dorn and Nina Markovna from September of 1990. Here we go. On the line with us now, Nina Markovna, who has written a beautiful book called Nina's Journey, a memoir of Stalin's Russia and the Second World War. She's in this country now. She's in Florida. We're going to be speaking to her. Good morning, Mrs. Markovna. Good morning, Karen. Um, first of all, you have been living in our country for, for some years, I believe. Yes. How, when did you come here? I came here as a young war bride uh, of an American serviceman uh, uh, at, uh, in 1950. Uh, that would be a story in itself, and I'm sure that that's in your book. How did you ever get out of the Soviet... How did you ever get out of that situation to get over here? Oh, well, that's what took 400 pages to explain in my, in my, in my book. But um, much, much... Uh, I described there many episodes that did lead me to America, which took, by the way, 12 years. The journey was 12-year-old journey. Sure, and here I am trying to get to the last chapter of the book, <laughs> and I don't want to do that, Mrs. Markovna. Now, first of all, when we in this country say Russia, we oh. generally really mean the Soviet Union, and we're only recently beginning to realize, I think most of us, that it is many, many countries. So what part of the Soviet Union are you from? I am ethnic Russian, a Moscovite. And it is so truly perceptive of you. I'm almost in shock to hear you, a radio host, talk so perceptively because that is not still understood by many, many people. But you are completely right. Russia is, is a... Div, is a um, main republic in that Soviet empire, mm -hmm. which, by the way, that republic is struggling to become free of Soviet rule, just as much as Ukraine does, mm -hmm. just as much as uh, Lithuania does, because it's amazing. Uh, a few years ago, the, I read in a um, book, Workers Paradise Lost. Remember by uh, by Eugene Lyons, mm -hmm. who American uh, American reporter and writer, who was by the way a communist himself, one day uh, at at one time. But then when he went to Soviet Union, met Stalin, he returned back. That Eugene Lyons returned back to America, completely cured man. And when he wrote this famous book of his Workers Paradise Lost. There was one phrase that I came up on so long ago, and I still remember it by heart. He described that Russians fighting communists, Lenin and Trotsky and Bolsheviks, Russians, by the way, I emphasize word, great Russians, and of course they lost the civil war, and they lost 10 million people in process. And when they lost, Eugene Lyons used that phrase, quote, Russia... Beca uh, Russia uh, became a country occupied by an internal enemy, hmm. unquote. And Kevin, those occupied by internal enemy, I mean, those words couldn't describe clearer what had happened to my ancestors' Russia. I don't call it my Russia anymore because I'm an American and my children are born here. I, I even didn't teach them Russian. That's how much American I am by now. But nevertheless, that Eugene, no, no one else expressed it so, so uh, accurately what Russia became. Occupied by internal enemy. And you know, Kevin, when I lived there, I didn't know who was my enemy. Is it my teacher, as I describe in, a, in my book, who betrayed my mother? and mother during the questioning, during that interrogation by uh, secret police lost her teeth. 
Or is it my next door neighbor watching from her window or his window and reporting my uncle, remember, who brought a little Christmas tree and was arrested for it and sent to Gulag and perished there? I mean, you truly, to this day, I think, even, in, if you live in Soviet Union, you don't know who this internal enemy is. So, and, and you know what, uh, Kevin, I wrote a book, first I thought I was writing my book for my uh, American descendants. That's how I first thought. And then I realized more and more that what drove me to the writing table to three years, uninterrupted work, because in English for me, I, I wore out three uh, dictionaries just to, to, to write it in English. And then I realized that I think I became so frustrated by books that come out even in the West, even written by comparatively um, objective uh, historians. Nevertheless, they still are so influenced by the Soviet ideology that, that much, much that did truly happen is omitted by the Soviet historians and our Western historians pick up that which Soviet historians let us know. And uh, another, George Orwell once said many years ago in another few words that forever stuck in my memory, he said, whatever Soviet rulers don't wish to remember, they dump it into, quote, a memory hole. And there is such a deep memory hole by now, Kevin, that I hope desperately few of my recountings will fill up that hole, even if, if slightly. Ms. Markonoff, uh, we, we want to take just a moment here to uh, remind our listeners if they're joining us. We're, we're talking to Nina Markovna. She's the author of Nina's Journey, a memoir of Stalin's Russia and the Second World War, just recently published. And I'll give you uh, the information at the end of the show, how you can get the book. But... Mrs. Markovna, let, let me go back to uh, World War II. Yeah. Um, the United States, uh, people in the United States tend to forget that it was Russia and Germany together, the communists and the Nazis together who were allies to start that war. But then, of course, Germany turned on the Soviet yeah. Union. Yeah. Now, there you were living under this, this monster, Joseph Stalin. Non-Russian, by the way. That many people don't realize. He, he really isn't a Russian. He's a Georgian, right? Yeah. He's ruling this empire, and in come the Germans. Now, we know that in Ukraine, the Ukrainians welcome the Germans as their liberators. But the people in, the Soviet, in, in Russia itself, what was their reaction? Well, and so did we. So did we. And I am not Ukrainian. I lived in Crimea. All the way, Kevin, 80 million, 80 million Soviet population, Ukrainers, Crimeans, Great Russians, all the tribes in Caucasus, 18 different uh, ethnic groups there, all of us, all the way to almost to, to, to Moscow, because Germans stopped just a few kilometers from Moscow. We all, with few exceptions, but 80 million people greeted German invaders as our liberators. By the way, before I forget it, are you aware that my story is in September issue of Reader's Digest? No, I didn't, but yeah. I'm very glad you mentioned yeah. that. The September issue of Reader's Digest, right. which is out now. Yeah, it's okay. out. And, and uh, so you're saying that it wasn't just the Ukrainians, it was all of the people. Absolutely. Uh, and my, my part, how I greet Germans with bread and salt, is, is, is in the Reader's Digest. They, they write about it, too. And there I stood, a young girl holding a tray with bread, which represents in our Russian Orthodox custom, uh, it represents earth, Mother Earth, and uh, salt represents life. And there we are, for the first time in a quarter of a century, people dropped on their knees and prayed openly, unafraid, because before that day, before the so-called ugly invaders came to us, we, we were arrested if we dared to pray. And uh, uh, this also is sort of dropped, so, uh, dumped into memory hole by the Soviet historians. Well, what, what would have happened, uh, this has been asked before, what would have happened had Hitler ordered his troops to be humane? If Hitler, you see, German soldiers are very different from Nazis. Nazis were the assessed, 
and Gestapo. German Wehrmacht were decent, decent men. I have met so many German soldiers who were convinced that they were in Russia to liberate us from, quote, Bolshevik cancer. You know, you, you say, you're making an interesting point there because recently I was reading some German propaganda in which they were trying, this is in World War II, trying to get all of the Europeans to join in what they called a crusade against the Bolsheviks. Yes, they did, and right now they're ashamed of it, and they just uh, deny it, but even French, even Netherlands, Belgians, Swedes, uh, Norwegians, uh, of course, all the Baltic states, uh, Lithuanians and Latvians, Georgians, everybody joined German, uh, special German units, you see. There was terrific great Russian army led by, uh, by defector General Vlasov, who was, uh, who was fighting Stalin, mind you. Not, uh, not Russia, but was... And, you know, those people, my, my unfortunate... Uh, uh, how you call those people that came from the same land with you? There is a word for it, but I forgot. Uh, uh, they were all called by, uh, by Stalin's allies traitors. And traitors, they were not. They were not traitors to their customs, to their culture, uh, to their Russian uh, or, or whatever religion. They were traitors to Stalin. Nina Markovna is our guest. Uh, she's the author of Nina's Journey, published by Regnery Gateway Press. It's certainly going to be in your bookstores. If it's not, you can order it. Nina's Journey. And uh, incidentally, it's, it's also featured in, in this month's Reader's Digest. Um, Mrs. Markovna, let me just ask you uh, a question about... Well, let me make a comment, then I'd like your reaction. Whenever one reads uh, Solzhenitsyn or Pasternak or any of the people like yourself who've lived through it, very candidly, it is so depressing. It's so hard to imagine yeah. people living through all of that. I think a lot of folks just like to turn it off and say, oh, isn't it wonderful now we have Yeltsin, now it's all over, isn't it wonderful? We said that about Khrushchev, too. I want to know what you have to say about this. You're looking now at some dramatic things taking place in the Soviet Union and, in fact, in your homeland, Russia. What is your reaction? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my, my reaction is not really uh, that of an average American who, who doesn't know Soviet Union, mm -hmm. who never lived there. Gorbachev, to me, remains, unfortunately, a uh, closet um, communist. He, he, he's very dedicated uh, to one-party rule. To this day, not too long ago, he said, Communist Party must remain the only ruling party over the army, over KGB, and over the population. But there is tremendous... Uh, uh, hope and wishful perhaps thinking on my part that Boris Yeltsin would step in and... Bo Boris Yeltsin, Boris ba Yeltsin. Yeah, uh -huh. Boris okay. Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. uh, the pure great Russian would step in and at least help his own people, Russian people, Russian Republic, to become independent of the Soviet Empire that Gorbachev leads. That's where the difference is. Gorbachev does not wish to uh, see that empire evaporate. That's why Lithuanians to this day are not yet free. So all my hope uh, is directed to, to Yeltsin. He left the party. Is that he one of the reasons? He left the party. Yeah. He threw his ticket party uh, card away and he became an independent Russian. And I applaud him. Look, you are an American citizen. You can speak with the same kind of freedom that any American citizen can speak. Does it trouble you that, that our government now is committed to keeping Gorbachev in power? Oh, and how. I just wrote a letter to my friend, and I said to him, I'm, I'm getting sick and tired of those two words, perestroika and glasnost, and I am nauseated, excuse me, please, by our president using those three words, new world order, which he just used a few days ago. I said, I remember so clearly those words, new world order uttered by Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin 45 years ago and they did create a new world order from which Kevin only now Central and Eastern Europe begin to uh, recuperate. I must tell you our time is up and I regret that because I, I do too. <laughs> I've really enjoyed speaking with the press. We can speak with you again. Thank uh, you. Nina Markovna, the author of Nina's Journey, a memoir of Stalin's Russia, 
and the Second World War. You will not regret purchasing this book, I promise you. It's a really wonderful book. See the September issue of Reader's Digest for more information. And Mrs. Markovna, thank you very much for being with us. Oh, I thank you. You most wonderful host. Thank you. You can really hear in that Cold War period show Nina Markovna's suspicions that a lot of conservatives had in the U.S. in those days that Mikhail Gorbachev might have been trying to fake out the West with a lot of talk about perestroika and talk of the changes. In those days, some on the right doubted that that was anything but talk. It was a common view back then. And you can hear the same skepticism coming up in the next segment in 2012. From a similar guest, Russian-born Leon Weinstein, who left the Soviet Union in 1972 and did not really trust Vladimir Putin. Leon Weinstein from 2012. That's next on the Newsmaker Shows. As we play the old shows from Kevin Doran, stay with us. Have you ever thought about saying goodbye to your job, just walking into your boss and saying, I quit? And how would you like to commute to work without ever leaving your home? Well, not long ago, a 39-year-old entrepreneur from a billionaire family spent $20 million and three years to find the best home-based business in North America. He researched 70 different companies, and when he found the only one that had real long-term potential, he bought it. And right now, he's looking for people to help him turn this company into his next billion-dollar success story. So if you're serious about making money from home without having to leave your home, well, grab a pen. Because I'm about to give you the address of a website where you can learn all about this unique and rare opportunity. Write this down, www.goherenext.com. Now get on your computer and go to this site now. Part-time or full-time, your income is based totally on your performance. Interested? Goherenext.com and say goodbye to your boss tomorrow. Goherenext.com. And before we get back to our Kevin Doran Newsmaker Series, let's check in with meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Get the forecast for today and New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Well, Brian, it's looking unusually mild for today. A lot cooler by the time we get into tomorrow. Tomorrow and even cooler weather by New Year's Day. It looks like uh, temperatures are going to run well above normal today thanks to a storm stretching from western Ohio to Minnesota that'll pass west of us. Brian, it's producing southeasterly winds and that's brought warmer weather into the region. But by tomorrow, the winds are going to change direction. There'll be more from uh, the west and southwest and that'll bring cooler air into the area. Today, though, take the umbrella. You'll need it. We'll have periods of rain. We're going to be 45 to 50. Tonight, light rain may start to mix with wet snow as we turn colder overnight. Lows will be 30 to 35. Tomorrow, final day of the year, cloudy skies, a few passing rain or snow showers. Highs tomorrow, only 35 to 40. Snow showers are possible tomorrow night. Lows 25 to 30. Mostly cloudy on Wednesday. Chance for some snow showers, Brian. Highs New Year's Day, 30 to 35. Sunrise this morning was at 739. The sun will set tonight at 447. And now back to the uh, Newsmaker Show. This one from November of 2012. Kind of along the same uh, theme as the last segment with Nina Markovna. This is Leon Weinstein talking about the uh, problems in the Soviet Union when he left there in 1972. Here we go. He came here in 1972. There was a lot of pressure on the Russians in 72 because they needed wheat. They, you know, the greatest wheat-producing country in Europe under the communists, could not make enough wheat for its own people. So they had to import wheat from us, chance for our farmers and bankers to make some money. So uh, the deal was made. About 50,000 people got out as a result of this uh, wheat for people exchange, and among them were uh, people who had families in the West, some Germans, some Polish descent people, and, and uh, you know Jews as well. The deal started in 1972. I applied in 1973 and only at 1974 they kind of allowed us to go but the main thing is I came to Vienna proceeded to Israel uh, spent and lived 11 years in Israel organized there a theater for children and youth um, won a couple of awards came to in 1984 to the United States of America to recreate a couple of my shows in the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in Jewish Museum in New York and also was invited after that after the success of the shows uh, to Los Angeles, to the LATC, Los Angeles Theater Center, received here an offer to stay longer, felt in love with California, and the story starts. And now you've written a book, is that correct? Uh, correct. In the last three years, uh, seeing what's going on here in the United States of America, and the direction that I suddenly realized this country is going, subtly and, you know, 
little step by step. I began to write articles that were widely read on the Internet. I received thousands of emails back thanking me for that. So I continued, wrote one book in 2009 and another, I think, probably the most significant, significant work that I ever done. And I wrote a lot, plays and, and, and books and, and stories and etc. But the last one called Capitalism 101, probably the summary of everything that I ever did or thought. Okay, now, you certainly are in a position, uh, having lived in Russia, not under Stalin, you would have been under, if I'm not mistaken, Brezhnev, is that right? Right, I was born during the Stalin era, I'm yeah. 62, so Stalin died when I was, what, six, seven years old. Yeah, he... I don't remember Stalin, but I, I remember stories about people crying on the streets that he died. Yeah, well, they cried when uh, Dear Leader dropped dead, too, out in... Uh, North Korea, but I, I yeah. doubt if anyone with any brains really cared. Now, listen, let me ask you this. You said you see some things happening in this country, the U.S. of A., that you had seen in Russia or that were reminders to you of what happened when the communists took over. What exactly are you seeing that's, that's troubling you? Uh, on the surface, uh, it's a rhetoric. Uh, which is very alarming because rhetoric usually then translates into actions and rhetoric of uh, fair share and we all need to care and uh, people uh, have to decide what to do with the money and, and so on and so on. You see, then uh, this country moved into competing with private industry in car production, competing with private banks and loans, competing with energy producers by betting with our money, as a matter of fact, on certain firms like Salandra, for example, and others, whom they choose to invest our money into. So what it creates, it creates the government that starts being much more than the limited government our founding fathers envisioned. It's now government. They can go to any direction they want. They can, as a matter of fact, go into wars without consulting with consulting, without receiving an order from a body that's supposed to order the government to do that, Congress, and they can do a lot of things, and no one stops them. So why? And they, the, the, the health care is, you know, a terrible thing. Uh, not because I don't believe that health care should be administered to people, but, but because, A, it created another entitlement, and number two, it's a 2,000 page of something that no one understands how to, it will impact the economy and life here, and most probably it will take more and more and more money from the productive citizens and give it to the people who didn't produce and didn't earn money. So it's, it's called wealth redistribution uh, that didn't work in, in the Soviet Union, didn't work in Poland, didn't work in Czechoslovakia, didn't work in Vietnam, in Cambodia, didn't work uh, in Argentina, um, you know, 50 years ago. Argentina, as a matter of fact, was number two economy in the world in the 40s and 50s, and it collapsed because they went the same direction that we're now going. So it's not only alarming now, it's, it's like, like, my God, the dark forces are all, all, all around us. Well, you know, Leon, this didn't happen in one day or one administration, but it certainly, I don't think anyone can argue with this, it has picked up speed enormously. You see, uh, I think that previous administration made a mistake uh, in, w when they decided to run on the basis of compassionate capitalism, which is totally crazy contradiction of terms. I don't want to go into this direction because it's a two-hour discussion. You know, Ayn Rand, the famous and great Ayn Rand, wrote once that capitalism and altruism are two very contradictory and impossible things to can exist because capitalistic economy cannot sustain a socialistic welfare state. So you're either compassionate or you're for capitalism. And capitalism builds roads and builds electricity and builds good life for everyone. And capitalism is what defers this country from, you know, mixture of freedom, liberty, and capitalism. That's what allowed this country in 200, near 200 years, build something that no country ever in the history of 6,500 years of the recorded history of the world were able to do. So we need to study how it happened. We need to follow that. We need to see to preserve it. We need to tell our children to preserve it and to fight for that. Instead of that, we are offering a person who never been, uh, who ever never uh, been manager of anything. You know, even a small group of people he didn't manage. He doesn't know what does it mean to meet to meet uh, uh, you know payroll. He doesn't want. Uh, he doesn't know what does it mean to have a board. He doesn't know what does it mean to manage uh, what country. I wouldn't hire him to manage my business.
business, has no idea about management, no idea about accounting, no idea about anything except he knows how to sweetly talk. And because we're allowing to vote everyone who, who even who never contributed to this country, you know, this is totally crazy as a matter of fact, if, if, if you will think about that. Now, what's going on with Putin? What do you think? Uh, first of all, I met the guy several times. Uh, really? How did you happen to meet yeah. Vladimir Putin? I, a friend of mine become uh, mayor of St. Petersburg hmm. uh, after, after Perestroika, you know, as a, but the, in the first three elections, uh, they, they elected a guy from, from university, professor from university, who also didn't have any, any real experience in governing or, or in management, and that was his big minus, but big plus was that, that he was, uh, you know, on a totally different side from the communists. So, uh, he, he, he began to, his tenure as a mayor, at a certain point, uh, he began to bring people whom he thought have uh, you know, more experience in management and, and stuff like that. And Putin want, was uh, actually ex-KGB officer. Uh, I didn't know that at that time. And he worked also at the university, although, although he worked at the department that encouraged students to tell on other students what they're saying. Mm. But uh, the mayor hired him and introduced me to him at a certain point. And after one conversation with Putin, I went to the mayor and said, look, uh, he's a typical KGB officer. Uh, if, if you will bring the same people in power, into power that we, you know, you kicked out of the power, why, why the whole revolution, the whole story is, uh, you know, what's happening? And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. He's totally different. He thinks differently. He's in, on our democratic side. And, and uh, then... Three, four, five times I talked to, to the guy, and I was scared because uh, he thinks like like KGB, meaning like secret police. Uh, his methods of work is the work of a secret police, um, eliminate a person or, or get rid of, of, of a competition for him is like, you know, slap your fingers. And uh, generally, he thinks that people are stupid and they needed to be governed with the iron hand. That's exactly what he is doing. Mm. Well, do you have any hopes that this time around the Russian people will be, well, I don't think there's any chance they can elect somebody else. I don't think that's in the cards. But do you think the majority of the people in Russia now would like to get rid of a guy like Putin and have a real democracy? No, because uh, you have two Russias. One uh, large part is rural Russia, uh, and small part, uh, three, four, five uh, cities, uh, like Moscow, like St. Petersburg, you know, a couple of others, where people who want freedom and not satisfied with something that has to do with, with the, their freedom, accessibility to information, free travel, and so on and so on, uh, live. And most of the Russia are people who live day to day, and all, one thing that they want is to have enough bread and, and, and butter and maybe a little entertainment and a lot of vodka accessible to them. If they have all that, and I'm not trying to put them down, uh, if they have all that, they don't really care who is in power. The important thing is no war for them and uh, enough bread and, and electricity, and this is it. They are actually happy with Putin. Listen, Leon, you're an interesting fellow to talk with. We'll have you back again. I want to thank you again so much for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Bye-bye. You know, I couldn't help but think listening to these shows that when Kevin was alive, he hammered away at the media in America with the positive spin that they put on communism. And this was uh, prior to 1991. I imagine if Kevin was still with us, he'd be speaking out against the whole socialist movement that we hear out of the Washington politicians today. Uh, these politicians say, oh, no, if, if we bring back socialism, it'll be friendly and it won't be like the old hardline communism. I imagine Kevin would be skeptical of those philosophies. Say in 1480 WLA Hornell, we continue the Kevin Dorn shows through Thursday of this week. Join us tomorrow.